Creation, not evolution. On this first slide, we're going to look at four pictures. Top left hand corner, we have a picture of a south facing slope, a grassy bank. Then we have a picture of a wild flower, it's actually wild thyme. Then there's a picture of red ants, and then we have the butterfly, the large blue. And in this presentation, we're going to look at the life cycle of the large blue, which is remarkable. And so much design is involved with this butterfly, one has to believe in a creator. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. O Lord, how manifold are thy works! In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. And certainly when we see the large blue, its life cycle, we marvel at it and we realise that there is a great creator. So we start off with that grassy bank and with that plant and wild thyme grows over Britain and flowers in May to September. It likes short grassland, grows on heaths, limestone, sea cliffs and sand dunes and around rock outcrops. It's a lovely colour and it's a beautiful flower, lovely arrangement of the petals. And the Latin here is Mamica sabulati, which is the name of those red ants. And those red ants like the short grass, and they figure largely in the life cycle of the large blue. They live in colonies up to a thousand strong, and they are to be found over the British Isles, but chiefly in the southern parts of England where it's warmer. Where the grass is longer, we have a different red ant, Mamica scabrinodis. These two can play a part in the life cycle of a large blue, but they are not so successful, the large blue, when this ant is involved. It's the Mamica sabaletti that's so crucial in the success of the large blue. So the naked eye, the two ants look um, virtually the same. You have to be a real expert to, to pick out one from the other. But one likes short grass and the other likes long grass. Now the large blue became extinct in 1979. But it was reintroduced in 1982-1983. And there's a whole story about that worthy of another talk. Suffice to say, they are still rare in this country. Um, there was a count made about 10 years ago of there being 11 sites, and in that particular summer there was about 10,000 on the wing. But if you see a, a large blue butterfly, you are doing very well. They are still rare. On this particular chart, we see the four different stages within the life cycle of the large blue. And we notice, looking at the black and the bottom line there, that the butterfly is on the wing in June and July. And you might likely to see it if the weather is good, the last week of June and the first week of July. The other thing there to notice is that the caterpillar stage predominates. You see the green strip there most of the life cycle is taken up for this butterfly as a caterpillar. Now the female butterfly, although she's only on the wing for a couple of weeks, she will mate and then lay eggs and she'll lay just one egg on her favourite plant, which is, of course, that wild thyme. And she'll lay one single egg on one flower head Ten days according to the weather conditions for that egg to hatch and a small caterpillar will emerge. And so it hatches in July. 
and it feeds on wild thyme and particularly on the flower and for the first few weeks of its life the caterpillar will just feed upon that one flower head from which the egg was originally laid. If it comes across another caterpillar then there will be warfare for their cannibalistic. It will grow, shed its skin, grow, shed its skin and within those first two stages it will stay within that same flower head but then it will move on and it will go to other flower heads and as it travels uh, it's more conspicuous and can be easily picked off by an insect or by a bird. And then after about three weeks something remarkable happens. The caterpillar flips off the plant. Now it doesn't travel down the plant, it literally flips off and falls to the ground. And now this is where the ant is so crucial because one of these red ants, either Mica sabaletti or a Mica scabronodis, will find the caterpillar and they, this, the ant will tap it once with its antenna and on doing that the caterpillar will secrete a small drop of honeydew, very sweet and this ant rejoices in this and then goes off and brings other ants with it back to the caterpillar and they enjoy a feast. After a period between 30 minutes or four hours, the original ant is then left alone to continue to milk it. So all the other ants will disappear and this always happens. And then this single original ant is left to continue to feed upon that cat caterpillar's honeydew that it's secreting. Then suddenly, and this is quite dramatic, suddenly the caterpillar changes shape, it distorts its body and now it looks like an ant grab, grub and the ant reacts to this and starts to look after it. You can see in the diagram how the large blue caterpillar distorts its body and in this photograph you can see the ant now taking away this caterpillar and it takes it away to its own ant nest. It thinks it's one of its own. It's been fooled in as much that the caterpillar is about the rise, right size. It's about the right hairiness and it also staggeringly produces a chemical scent that's so similar to that which the grubs, the larvae of the ant has. And so the ant, not interested now so much in the sugar, the honey tasting a liquid, it's now panicking. It wants to get this, what it thinks is an ant grub, back to the nest. And so with care, maybe pick it up and take it. And this process will stay in the late afternoon when the ants, ants begin foraging. If the caterpillar came off the plants, sprung off the plant in the morning, uh, it probably won't be found by an ant and it'd probably be devoured by a bird or, a, or an insect. But if it does it at the turn of the day, after midday, at the time when ants start foraging, then it may be found by a sabaletti. But it's got to be found that day. Caterpillar won't survive any longer than 24 hours. Inside the ant's nest, the caterpillar secretes more and more honeydew on which the red ants and their young feed. So they delight in that. But then the caterpillar seeks out the nesting chambers and its character changes altogether. For now, the caterpillar starts to feed. It's its turn to feed. And now it feeds on the ant eggs and the larvae. And it will do that through the rest of the summer and through the autumn and then during the winter period it will hibernate in that nest. 
and into the new year, about the time of May, when it's now 100 times bigger than it was when it entered the nest, it will go into a chrysalis. It would have eaten well over a thousand eggs by then, a thousand ant grubs by this time. Now if it's not ready to change into a butterfly, it will stay in the nest as a caterpillar for another whole 12 months. So whether it's the first May or the May following after, the caterpillar will change into a chrysalis. And in that form, again, something remarkable happens. And I don't think this is happening by chance. I don't think this is happy mutations occurring over millions of years, as evolutionists would think. I don't think this is a happy throw of the dice repeatedly going over 666 six, six all the time. No, this is all of God's plan and design. It's a very intricate life cycle, and the facets to it are highly sophisticated. And so in the early stages of a caterpillar becoming a chrysalis, it starts making a scraping sound. And it seems now to the ant, to the workers, to be a queen ant. And so it will look after it. And it takes about three weeks for that caterpillar to break down into liquid and then for it to be reconstituted and to change into something completely different, into a butterfly, a beautiful butterfly at that. And all through this period, the ants at worst have looked, uh, ignored it and at best have kept predators off. And then once the butterfly emerges from the chrysalis and we have a butterfly underground in the ant nest, it will start to move towards the opening of the nest. And the ants will escort it. There'll be a procession of lead, they will lead it out and watch over it. And even when the blue butterfly, the large blue, rests upon a stalk or on grass to dry out its wings, those ants will encircle it and ward off any predators until the wings unfold and harden, until the large blue flies away. Now this is a remarkable, wondrous, amazing life cycle. It's dependent upon the south bank, short grass, wild thyme, red ant, and all those various different things that the caterpillar does and the way that the ants react. The whole thing is very complicated and it's done over a long period of time. Oh Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. And so the large blue Beautiful butterfly in itself and its life cycle, truly amazing. Its habitat is very precious. Most of the sites where we find the large blue are in the southern part of England and the area of Somerset. Got to have those south facing banks with short grass, got to have that wild thyme, we've got to have the Sabaletti ant, that red ant thriving and all those conditions have to exist all those relationships have to take place all those wonderful things have to occur before eventually after nine months or even over 20 months eventually that which is an egg becomes a wonderful beautiful large butterfly only on the wing for such a short period, a couple of weeks, and then the cycle starts all over again. I now recommend that you look at Psalm 148, a beautiful psalm of praise to God, recognising that God is the great creator. And within that psalm, the psalmist talks about various different life forms, 
and the psalmist will talk of insects and within those will be the large blue.